Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining our today's session on COVID-19 Ask WHO, actually Ask Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove today. Um, we have a little bit different week than usual because our executive board is meeting here in Geneva. Uh, so we have ha had to change our date and time for this session, and we have Maria um, only today. But thank you, Maria, for finding the time. I know this is really, really busy as there's a lot of conversations going on on COVID and other other emergencies at the moment. Well, thanks for having me. Um, before the executive board met, <coughs> uh, I know this all these terms may confuse some of our <laughs> viewers, but we had a regular uh, meeting of emergency committee on COVID-19 that meets every three months. And the, Dr. Tedros accepted their assessment that COVID is still a public health emergency of international concern. So can you please clarify for our viewers, what does that mean and what are the recommendations for each and every of us? Yeah, so thanks, Alex, uh, for having me back. And it is a busy time, but we love doing these. And I think it's an important way to communicate and answer these questions directly. So as you pointed out, um, the Emergency Committee for COVID-19 did meet just before the EB. Um, and as you say, they meet every three months or so. Um, to assess the current situation and, and give the director general advice on whether the current situation or the COVID situation uh, constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. And it's the director general who takes the decision of whether or not it does. And he agreed uh, with their assessment, with their advice, um, that the current situation still constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Um, but they did note, uh, and he also notes, that we're in sort of a transition period, an inflection point, if you will, because we're in a much better situation than we were three years ago, um, given when this is a new virus and when it was first circulating. And now we have so many tools that can actually reduce the impact of COVID-19 in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and so it means that we're still in that emergency phase. Now, all countries are in different situations for a variety of reasons, you know, based on their current situation in terms of what variants are circulating, their population level immunity, their access and use of tools, their ability to adjust and surge when there are increases in cases, um, the way that they have utilized vaccines and have boosted their vulnerable populations. Um, and countries are working very hard right now to manage COVID and to live with COVID responsibly. Um, but we haven't yet reached a phase where we are living with it responsibly and controlling it and managing it like we, we deal with other diseases. So we're still in that emergency phase. Um, and so there's a lot that needs to be done to get through that. The DG has said many times um, that he believes, and, and I agree, that we can end this emergency in all countries um, this year. We had hoped we could have done it last year and it was possible, um, but we didn't quite make that goal. But this year, we can do that. Thank you, Maria. And I would just like to remind all our viewers, uh, if they're watching us on Twitter, to use, use the hashtag AskWHO to ask their questions. Sorry, I'm switching between cameras here. Uh, if you're watching us on other uh, channels, please use the comment section, and I will pass your questions to Maria. Um, Maria, since Dr. Tedros uh, shared what is the outcome of those this emergency meeting and the decision that he has made based on their recommendations, we've seen some confusion in uh, social media conversations between what is public health emergency of international concern versus pandemic. What is the difference? So maybe you can help and, and clarify. Yeah, we've gotten this question quite a lot during this, this pandemic, and it, it is a good question because some of these terms are quite confusing. When we talk about the public health emergency of international concern, that's really an extraordinary event, you know, requiring international collaboration. And, and we're still in that phase. Um, and we still see incredible impact of COVID-19 in many countries around the world. We've seen an increase in deaths in the last eight weeks alone. That was even before the surge of Omicron in China recently, um, where we had more than 170,000 deaths in the last eight weeks alone across the globe, including those deaths in China. And so ending the emergency phase um, ending the public health emergency of international concern is a goal where we get to and we can manage COVID more responsibly. 
the pandemic is something very different. And I know a lot of a lot of times the question of the fake and the pandemic fake is the acronym for public health emergency of international concern. And the pandemic are all often asked at the same time, but they're very different things. This virus is here with us to stay. This pandemic virus is very much here with us to stay. And we're going to have to live with it more responsibly as we go forward. That means living our lives. It means living our lives as safely as possible, getting vaccinated and boosted when it's recommended for us, wearing a mask when you're indoors and when you know you don't have good ventilation, taking measures that reduce your exposure, that reduce your risk of infection, the risk of getting long COVID, the risk of passing the virus to somebody else who is more vulnerable, and also supporting gover government supporting health systems to maintain surveillance, for clinical care pathways to be strengthened to deal with surges um, in impact and hospitalizations, making sure that we have access to antivirals in countries. So there's a lot that needs to be done as we manage it going forward. But the pandemic will be with us for a long time, but the emergency of it doesn't, ha doesn't have to be. And that's what we're working with all countries to end. Thank you so much, Maria. Here's a question from Charlie T Char uh, Charlene. Um, Turner saying that some medical facilities have lifted their mask requirements for medical staff and office staff. It is exceptionally concerning since my area has moderate community transmission of COVID-19. So our recommendations are to continue to wear masks uh, when you're around others and in indoor situations, certainly for health workers, masks or respirators, um, depending on the situation that they're in, N95s or, or FFP2s uh, when they're caring for patients, um, because the virus is circulating around the world pretty much unchecked right now. So we know the case numbers that are reported to us are are low, are underestimates. Um, and so the virus is circulating. So masks are part of the comprehensive package to control transmission, um, to limit the spread, to protect you as an individual. And for health workers, this remains critically important as well as other personal protective equipment. So our recommendations are still, um, still in effect. Thank you so much, Maria. You mentioned that we've had increase in, in, in cases and that. So mm -hmm. maybe we can go back to our usual update on yeah. epidemiological situation at the moment and where the, the, the transmission hotspots are. Yeah, so I have to, I'm switching with my looking at my epi update. So we recently revised our weekly epidemiologic update where we're giving monthly periods now because the data that is reported to us on a weekly basis is very inconsistent across the globe. This is something we're working with all of our member states on to improve because we still need to be able to track this virus. And we can talk about that when we talk about variants later. But more importantly, we need to be able to track hospitalizations, admissions to ICU and deaths. Um, and so what we're looking at now is a week is a month by month basis. Um, and compared to last month, we've seen a decline in the number of cases reported to us, but that's off the backdrop of a significant drop from China. Um, where we had a very large number of more than 45 million cases reported in a single week across the world, including cases from China. In fact, we had to redraw, we had to rescale the epi curve that we, we regularly show and almost dwarfed um, some of the previous waves of infection that we had seen previ previously. But month by month, we're seeing a, an increase in deaths. And this is what concerns us. Four years into a pandemic where we have many safe and effective vaccines, when we have many antivirals and therapeutics that save lives, when we have diagnostics that can get patients into the clinical care pathway, we should not be seeing increases in deaths. And this is part of the challenge. As we manage COVID going forward, we should see that death number, that death decline. And we're not, we're starting to see it increase. So this is what worries us. Um, we see some hot spots around the world in terms of increases in deaths. And what we look at now is the decoupling. We will see waves of infection, but we don't, that doesn't have to track with increases in hospitalizations. And some countries are keeping deaths and hospitalizations low. Others are really struggling with that. And the countries that are struggling with increases in deaths are those that are missing populations that have vulnerable populations, people at risk, over 60 people immunocompromised with underlying conditions that have not received the full number of vaccine doses. And these are the individuals who are ending up in hospital, hospital and who are dying. Um, and so this is what concerns us. Eight, nine weeks of increasing deaths is not where we should be four years into a pandemic. 
Maria, thank you so much. And I'm glad you mentioned the immunocompromised because we got a question if if the measures are lifted or emergency is lifted, uh, what do we do to protect people who are immunocompromised? Well, that's a great question because there's so many tools that we have that can, that can protect mm -hmm. individuals. And as individuals, you need to know what to do to keep you safe and those around you safe. Um, and it starts with knowing your risk as an individual and knowing the risk of the people who are around you and utilizing different tools. Self-testing if you have access to tests. If you're infected, stay away from others. Um, if you are around others um, and you are in busy places, you're on public transportation, wear a mask, a well-fitting mask over your nose and mouth. Um, make sure as much as you can to keep distance from others. And we know that that's not possible in all situations, but where feasible, keep, keep distance, but wear a mask, especially when you're in crowded places. Um, open windows, make sure that you have good ventilation where you are as best you can. And in workplaces, we need to ensure that workplaces have better ventilation. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do. Among those who are vulnerable, um, who are in a vulnerable category, an at-risk category, make sure you're vaccinated and especially make sure you're boosted. Our recommendations are that you need to be boosted. Uh, your, your latest boost should be four to six months after your last one. And that recommendation, follow your national guidelines, but make sure that you're up to date on your booster. This is really, really important for anyone who's over 60, anyone with underlying conditions, immunocompromised, and also for our health workers. Thank you, Maria. And here is just, I'm just gonna read out the comment from uh, Devin Az, um, who is watching us from uh, on Facebook. Uh, it, we are still feeling the impact of COVID-19. We need to live our lives as safely as possible. Thank you. Uh, Maria, maybe we can also go into variant update. Is Omicron still the most transmissible variant, and do we have any further updates on the XBB.1.5 subvariant? So Omicron variant of concern is still the most transmissible variant um, to date, but right now there are more than 600 sublineages of Omicron that we're tracking. Um, so the virus continues to evolve. Um, XBB.1.5 is one of these. It's a, it's a recombinant of two BA.2 sublineages, which was XBB, and it's actually a further sub, subvariant of XBB. Um, we just published an updated risk assessment of this where we looked at its growth advantage, and it does have a growth advantage over other subvariants that are in circulation. Um, we do not see a change in severity but that data that we have to assess severity of XBB.1.5 is currently limited. There are about 9,000 or so sequences globally that are available for XBB.1.5. Um, and we are tracking this in, in many different countries. Most of the sequences are from the US, but there are some from Europe as well and some other countries as well. So we expect XBB.1.5 to increase in terms of its incidence, so we expect more people to be infected with this, and we are and we are very carefully looking at severity. The one thing that we can say about this variant is it doesn't have a mutation that would necessarily mean or confer more severe disease, but we have to watch. Um, unfortunately, right now globally, we're in a situation where as sequencing as surveillance declines as sequencing declines, the amount of information that our Technical Advisory Group for Virus Evolution has to assess this is decreasing. It doesn't mean everyone around the world needs to be sequenced. We just need good geographic representation of the sequences around the world. We need studies to be done to evaluate each of these subvariants. Um, but so far, um, yes, XBB.1.5 has a growth advantage. Um, but in terms of severity, we don't see more or less severe disease compared to other sublineages of Omicron. But remember, Omicron can cause the full spectrum of disease, everything from asymptomatic infection all the way to severe disease and death. And your risk of severe disease increases if you are of older age, if you're over 60, if you are immunocompromised, if you have underlying conditions, and most importantly, if you're not vaccinated or if you have not received the full number of boosters. So please get vaccinated because our vaccines are incredibly safe and effective. And I know you did a recent um, Q&A with Kate O'Brien who answered a lot of questions around that. And it's important that people understand that we are constantly assessing these vaccines. We're constantly assessing the diagnostics, the therapeutics to make sure that the advice that we give is the right advice 
Um, if it could be refined, we will refine it and we will update that advice and issue it as quickly as possible. Thank you so much, Maria. We are getting a question from Tonian Carrier watching us on LinkedIn. Uh, the question is about COVID and children. Do we have any latest information how it impacts children or how many children uh, are getting infected? So uh, Omicron and COVID affects people of all ages. Um, children are susceptible to infection. They have been since the beginning. Um, on average, children tend to have more mild disease compared to older adults, certainly compared to older adults, people who are in that at-risk category. But we do see the full spectrum of disease in children as well. And children have died from COVID-19. Um, every, every death from COVID-19 is absolutely tragic, but having a death among a child is just, it's just heartbreaking. Um, so there's a lot that we can do to protect our children as well. Um, and in some countries, they're vaccinating children as well. Um, in some countries, children of certain ages are wearing masks and children are, are going back to school. It's really critical that schools stay open and children receive the education and that security that they need. Um, but all of us, you know, the virus circulates in people um, and children are, are susceptible as well. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, we are also having uh, some questions uh, about um, long COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people have been impacted and do we know how to treat it? So long COVID or post COVID-19 condition is something that we are um, focused on. Um, there are some estimates um, that maybe 10% of people who are infected with COVID will develop a post-COVID-19 condition. We're still learning this. This is just an estimate. Um, we do see data that is coming out that suggests people have um, symptoms that are affecting many different organs of the body, um, the brain, the heart, the lungs, and really some debilitating um, effects, long-term effects. Uh, many uh, will recover after a year, but the bottom line is we don't have all the answers on long COVID. And I really, I really hate giving that answer. Um, I would love to be able to give a full comprehensive answer, tell you everything that we, we can say about this, but it is something that we are learning. Um, we need more research in this area. There are many groups that are out there that are studying this. There are papers that are coming out every day. Um, our clinical management group, our rehab group, many different groups within WHO um, are working together um, because long COVID affects many parts of the body. It's not just a quote unquote respiratory disease. It affects all of the organs and we need to be planning for this. So we're working not only on the recognition within ICD codes for medical professionals, but we're looking at how do we develop the best clinical management and provide therapeutics for people who are suffering from post COVID-19 condition. So it's, it's a work in progress. Um, but those of you who are out there who are suffering from this, there are many that are focused on this. We will not forget you. Uh, and this is not something that is a priority that is going to go away for WHO. Um, so hang in there and, and fight as hard as you can. Um, and we will as well for you. Thank you so much, Maria. We are getting questions um, to specific patients group uh, and COVID. And here is uh, a question about COVID-19 among dialysis patients and its impact. Uh, from someone also watching us on LinkedIn. Do we have any information? What's the question? Uh, about dialysis patients mm -hmm. and uh, impact of COVID on, on these type of patients. Well, I'm not a medical professional. My son likes to tease me all the time that I'm not a real doctor. I'm actually an epidemiologist and not a medical professional. Um, we do know that there are certain um, groups that have underlying conditions that are impacted more than others. And people on dialysis, people with underlying conditions tend to be more impacted in terms of having more, a higher risk of severe disease. I think what is important is that anyone who is infected with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2, anyone who develops COVID-19 needs to be provided the right clinical care in that clinical care pathway, wherever you show up in the course of your disease, whether it's an acute infection, whether you've just been infected and you're dealing with the acute disease, or you are dealing with the post COVID condition, whether it's three months after you recovered or even longer from that. And that's what we want to ensure that that pipeline, that pathway is solid. And that pathway within governments and within health facilities is strengthened. We don't want to see standalone systems dealing with COVID only. We want patients who show up at their healthcare professional at primary care or with specialists receive what the care that they need, depending on your exact situation. Thank you so much.
much, Maria. Sorry, we are getting very interesting questions, and some are longer, so I'm I'm trying to to read them as well. Here is a question from someone who is watching us regularly. It's Mina Nian. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing this well. Um, can you update us on the progress of the global pandemic treaty? Will there be any major differences in terms of pandemic preparedness when we face another one in the future to come? Oh, that's a great question. Every time you say when someone is watching us regularly, I think you're going to ask me a question from my sister who watches us regularly in the United States. Um, with regards to the treaty, the, the discussions are ongoing. Um, and so the answer to the question is, I certainly hope so. Um, I think the whole idea of this treaty or accord or whatever it's called or will be called is really a promise um, to do better um, by all member states, by everyone around the world. Um, we've learned a lot from this the last three years, the last three plus years, um, and that's learning from other outbreaks and other pandemics. We owe it to our children, our families, to the people who've died from COVID-19 to do better. And for me, I'm not part of the discussion, so I can't speak to the details of it. But for me, it's a promise. And I absolutely hope. Um, hope is not a strategy, as Mike Ryan always says. But there are concrete steps that member states are taking right now to discuss this to ensure that we do better for the next time. Thank you, Maria. Here is another question. Uh about strategies uh, from Light Andur. Uh, what are your current strategies for ending the COVID pandemic in 2023? You are the leading international health agency that provides guidance and support to countries affected by the virus. You are also closely monitoring the developments and advancements in treatments, vaccines, and other measures to control the spread of the virus. So what new strategies is the WHO implementing in 2023 to combat the ongoing COVID pandemic differently from what have been previously implemented? So it's an excellent question. It's not about what we're doing, what needs to be different in terms of the strategy. It's how we implement that strategy in the context of every other global challenge that we face right now. COVID is not the only emergency that's out there. It's not even the only health emergency that's out there. We're dealing with floods, we're dealing with droughts, we're dealing with war, we're dealing with displacement. Um, we're dealing with so many different challenges around the world and COVID is one of those. So what we are working with member states on right now, we, we want to end this emergency in every country on the planet in 2023. And we can do this. We can do this because we have so many tools that exist right now. We don't have to wait for them to be developed. They exist now. So what we are asking all member states, all countries around the world to do is to reassess their situation. Have a fresh look at what you're doing and look at what needs to be adjusted. The big thing we don't wanna see is dismantling of systems and say, COVID is over, we can't deal with it anymore. No one wants to talk about it anymore, which we completely understand. I wish I didn't have to talk about it anymore, but we can't see a dismantling of the systems that have been strengthened. At the same time, we can't see the systems operate at that level that they were at when it was really at its peak. So we need to strengthen the systems in countries around surveillance. We need to strengthen the systems in, in countries around sequencing. We need to strengthen the clinical care pathway so that any individual, if they are infected with whatever they have, flu, RSV, COVID, they get into that clinical care pathway, they receive that antiviral as quickly as possible. So we prevent the hospitalization. If patients need hospitalizations, we need to optimize that care with the right therapeutics, oxygen, ventilation, um, so that we save lives. We, we prioritize and focus our vaccination campaigns to ensure that we reach 100% of the at-risk groups. 100% of individuals need to be boosted who are over 60, who have underlying conditions, who are immunocompromised, and our frontline workers. And it's making sure we, we don't forget about the basics. We use the tools that we can in terms of masking, improving ventilation where we live, we work, we study. That's a long-term investment, which we have not seen enough investment in. Um, while we live our lives, um, and it is about pushing R&D. So we're not done understanding this virus. This virus has been circulating for three years, um, which seems like an eternity for all of us, but there's still a lot to learn. So we need innovation in personal protective equipment to be built and structured for women. 
because most of healthcare providers are women and PPE is designed for men. We need new and updated vaccines that focus on preventing infection and transmission. And there's some really interesting work coming out on inhaled vaccines. We need to understand more about the different types of public health and social measures, how they can be used, which ones have the best impact for the least amount of social um, disruption, uh, the least amount of political um, interference or political challenges and we really need to build trust. So it's really about adjusting these strategies as we go forward. We're in a transition phase right now, and it's messy because everybody wants it to be over like there's a switch to say we're in, a, in an emergency and we're no longer in an emergency. But there's too many uncertainties around the virus and its evolution in terms of potential recombinants and potential you know, variants of concern that may emerge. There is too little agility and elasticity within systems to be able to surge up and down, we're just not there yet. We haven't optimized the cl clinical care pathways. We have not optimized access. 30% of the world hasn't received a single vaccine. So there's a lot more that we can do to adjust our strategies as we go forward, but it's not a massive shift. The massive shift is in our mindset and in how we deal with this in the context of everything else. Thank you so much, Maria. This was really great explanation. So thank you for that. And while you, I'm also thanking uh, our viewer for this great question. Great question. Um, here's a question from Mark, who is watching us on Twitter. And the question is, are multiple COVID infections worse? As a repeated infections. Repeated. So that's, a, that's also, these are great questions today. Um, so we don't want to see people get infected multiple times from COVID if possible, because there is a risk of developing severe disease every time you get COVID. Um, of course, your, reduced, your, your risk reduces if you are vaccinated and if you are boosted, of course, um, and if you are healthy, if you don't have underlying conditions. But what we worry about is the risk of long COVID and post-COVID-19 post -COVID condition. So every time you get infected, um, we don't know the full impact of multiple infections. No, I, I could give you a, an answer, but the short answer is we, we don't really have all of the answers yet. And this is one of the ones we don't. So we want to make sure that we protect ourselves from getting infected. I was really worried, if you remember, Alex, at the beginning of last year, people were saying, well, if Omicron is so infectious, then why don't we just get it over with and get infected? And that was incredibly dangerous. We heard that in other countries around the world as the year progressed. It still remains important that you don't get infected. And for those of you who've had COVID, COVID is not a light disease. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Even quote unquote mild COVID is really, it can floor you um, and really take you out and make you and stay at home and can be really debilitating. But you also um, run the risk of developing post COVID-19 condition. And again, we don't have the full, a full understanding of that. So we don't want to see people get infected multiple times. Thank you, Maria. Here's a question from someone watching us on LinkedIn. Will, what will be your advice to people who are worried about if there will be any situation same like 2020, 2021? Are, are we now sure we will not have serious pe period like earlier? I think we're in a much better situation where we wouldn't see a repeat of 2020 for sure. Because if you remember in 2020, we knew so little about this virus. Um, we had no interventions in terms of therapeutics or vaccines. We're not in that situation. We have knowledge. We have, although we're still learning, we're still humble to this, we don't know everything, but we have so many safe and effective vaccines that are showing that they're preventing people from dying. That's, that's a game changer. Um, you know, when we were in 2020, in the spring of 2020, I remember us talking about this when we were trying to develop the target product profiles for COVID-19 vaccines, and we were hoping for 50% efficacy. And we had vaccines that were 98% efficacy, you know, above 90, 95%. That is remarkable. Safe and effective vaccines, saving people's lives. I don't know how many people around the world were saved because of vaccines. There are some estimates on that. But really, complete game changer. Um, but we also have many therapeutics. We have incredible health workers around the world who have put their lives on the line to care for individuals who they don't know, who held their hands, who cared for them through the darkest of times in 2020, and who continue to care for COVID-19 patients. They have the experience, they have the wisdom, um, and, and they 
deserve tremendous respect from all of us. Um, so we shouldn't go back to that situation. Um, we, when we think about planning, we think in these scenarios and we think of the best case and we think of the worst case. And for planning purposes, that's important. But the likelihood that we would go back to that um, is probably low. But we have to be prepared for anything. Thank you so much, Maria. And as we are now in the fourth year, you say we are in a much better place. Um, reflecting on some, some of those uh, days in 2020 and strategies, etc., it feels really like in the past life. But do you know how many lives have been lost since the beginning of this pandemic due to this virus? And how high is the COVID toll on human lives in comparison to other health threats? So that's also an interesting and a difficult question um, because we may never know the true toll of COVID-19 deaths. Um, there are some estimates, you know, we have deaths that are reported to us, uh, more than 6 million deaths um, reported to us, every one a person, you know, a mother, a father, a child, um, a friend. Um, and each one is tragic, and I don't think we've really begun to mourn the loss. Um, but that estimate, that number of reported deaths is certainly an underestimate. Um, we've done some work here, um, and it's, it's likely to be almost three times higher than that, at least. Um, but we do look at countries who are doing some excess mortality estimates, um, and the true toll is likely higher than that. So we don't know the exact number. But every one of you who is out there has been impacted by COVID. And if you've lost someone, we grieve your loss. We mourn your loss with you. Um, and we are doing everything that we can. This is our whole purpose, is to keep the world safe. Our whole purpose is to save lives. And we can do that now. So do what you can. Play your part. We've talked about this many times. You have a role to play, to play your part. Keep yourself safe, first and foremost. But also keep those safe uh, around you. Um, and there's a lot that each of us can do. Each of us uh, plays that role. And that remains as important now in the fourth year of this pandemic as it did at the start of the pandemic. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, looking into uh, some brighter topics and uh, future generations and the role of you that we are trying to increase here. Um, we have a special guest, Eloise, who is <laughs> In, uh, in schools around us, there is uh, work experience for a week, um, and we've been pleased to have Eloise with us uh, on different social media activities behind the scenes. Welcome, Eloise. Hi. Thank you for being with us this whole week and today, and I will give you the mic, actually, for you to ask <laughs> a question to Maria. Um, I was just wondering, uh, do you think it's this whole situation is getting better, or is it getting worse than how it was in 2020. Do you think we're going to maybe go back into another lockdown? Well, thanks for being here, and I'm glad <laughs> you're spending the week with us. It's great to have you join our panel today. Um, I think we're in a much better situation than we were in 2020. Um, you know, as I was just saying, we have so many tools right now that can save people's lives. I was reflecting back, I reflect back a lot on 2020 and just remembering those early days and how much we didn't know, how much uncertainty there was. And while we don't know everything, we know a lot more. And the global community has come together to fight this invisible pathogen that's affected all of us. And I'm really hopeful. I mean, I feel really positive about 2023 um, that we can end this emergency. There, there's no reason why we would need to go into any sort of lockdown. Um, you know, countries utilized that tool. It was a blunt force instrument because they had no choice. That was not a recommendation of WHO, but they, they were forced to do that because they were overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. But systems are coping. Um, health systems are fragile right now, and many of them are feeling the pressure. You've seen news reports of many hospitals feeling quite burdened and healthcare professionals feeling quite overwhelmed by the number of cases of COVID and flu and RSV. And, but we're in a much better situation. So I, I think um, we need to focus on the positive and the things that have gone well. So much has gone wrong and we can focus on that. But if we, if we turn the question and if we actually look to each other and say, what went well or what are you doing well how are you managing these challenges? Um, you know, what didn't you get quite right and how did you navigate this and course correct? I really think we will be even better
better off in the middle of this year and towards the end of this year. Um, but we also need your help. We need the help of everybody who's out there. We need innovative ideas, um, new solutions. We like I like to call it kicking the tires um, and challenge us all to, to be better and think differently um, because we're leaving the world to you. I'm not quite sure what world, no pressure, <laughs> no pressure. Um, but we all have a responsibility to make this world better. So I look very much forward to working with you, Eloise, um, in your future, uh, and hopefully you'll come work for us someday. She um, has proud to be WHO here. <laughs> well, perfect. Um, but no, I think we're in a much better situation. We just have to, we just have to keep working hard. We can't become complacent. The threat is not over. And that's a hard thing to say of, yes, I'm hopeful and we can end this emergency, but we can't give up. We can't let up. And so while everyone's out there living their life and you're living your life and you're going to school and that's wonderful and that needs to continue, governments need to work incredibly hard to keep their system strong, to make sure that they have, have the agility to scale up and scale down as we go forward, because we can't predict the future with 100% certainty. So um, I look forward to working with you in the future, Eloise. Thank you. Thanks to you and thanks to you, Maria, for your time. And thanks to all our viewers who were with us, who have been with us today. Uh, some of them are from Colombia, some are from South Sudan, Poland, India, Nepal, Guatemala, Venezuela, DRC, Peru, uh, Nigeria, Zambia, Denmark, Tanzania, Senegal, Iran, the US, Kenya, Togo, Ghana, Canada, Chad, Pakistan, the UK, and I'm sure many others. Uh, thanks to all our, our colleagues behind the scenes here in the studio and also the social media team monitoring all the questions. Um, have a good weekend. Be safe, as Maria said, um, and we will talk to you next week. Goodbye.